So, I guess anybody want to pray? Does anybody other than Bobby want to pray? Not that I'm not going to allow Bobby to pray, but Bobby prays every week and he does a fine job. But does anybody else want to pray? If not, let's remove our hoodie. We don't wear these in the church, buddy. Here's your thing, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. I ask that you be with us today. I ask that we have a good time today. I ask that we have a good Sunday service, and I ask that we have a good time today. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen, amen, thank you. All right, and we will release the children. So before we get started, I did want to talk on one timely thing, and, and I think we all know. Um, everybody, of course, is talking about the war in the Middle East. Uh, this isn't the first war in the Middle East. It certainly won't be the last. But when you listen to the pundits and the people talking, and I don't very often, I don't, I don't really watch the news anymore because, quite honestly, it's depressing and Really, all you got to do is read this, and you can see what exactly what's going on in our world right now. But most of the people that I hear talk about it's about land. It's not about land. Uh, Israel is where Israel is because that's where God put them. They are the chosen people. But this war is strictly about one group of people wanting to wipe another group of people off the earth. They don't just want their land, they want them gone. So we really, really pray for Israel and pray for all the people. Uh, Jesus even told us to pray for our enemies. So we need to pray not only for Israel and the people of Israel. We need to pray for the Palestinians. We need to pray for Hamas. We need to pray that they will find God, the God, not a God. Um, and for us, being so far away, we often wonder what we can do to help these things, what we can do to be of assistance and as Christians the most important thing that we can do is follow the last words that Jesus said before he left this earth therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I will always be with you to the very ends of the age the only way to change a man's heart and a woman's heart is to ch the only way to change their mind is to change their heart. And the only way to change their heart is to introduce them to Jesus. And we know from this book that there is never going to be peace until Jesus comes back. But the more people who know Jesus, the less people who will need to be destroyed for eternity. And I just wanted to mention that. I know a lot of people talk about it, and, and, and we all have our own thoughts, and we all have our own prayers, but as much as we pray for people, we need to talk about Jesus, because that's the only thing that's going to save everybody, because Jesus is the only one that saves everybody. So today and next week, I originally thought this was going to be a quick, not a quick, but a one-day message. And then, of course, as I sat and pondered it and, and meditated on it, I realized that there's a lot here for one day. And we know we can go three, four hours sometimes, but y'all start giving me that look when I start going long. So um, to make it easier, I'll be, and again, I'll be preaching next week, so I'm going to cover it. So today we're going to be talking about sin and repentance. And we all know these words, and we've heard them. Um, we hear them often, especially churches like this. True Bible teaching preach, uh, churches will talk about sin, and they will talk about repentance. But there's a lot of churches out there now that don't. Or if they do, they don't talk about true repentance. Um, repentance is probably one of the most important words and actions in our Christian walk. Second only to the gospel. Repentance is something that every follower of Jesus should know and understand and comprehend exactly what it is and what it means. The world, I guess you would say, their definition, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary says, the action or process of repenting, especially for misdeeds or moral shortcomings. And what does it mean to repent? To turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's lives. 
also it is to feel regret or contrition to change one's mind. I found a good description on a website called gotquestions.org. I was really surprised that it was such a good one because of, I don't know, I guess I didn't figure some place that's just a basic got questions would have a good definition, but it says, many understand the term repentance as turning from sin, and that's what I have always understood it to be. Regretting sin and turning from it are related to repentance, but are not the precise meaning of the word. In the Bible, the word repent means to change one's mind. The Bible also tells us that true repentance is a result, will result in a change of action. The word repentance in Greek, the Greek word used for repentance in the New Testament, means to change one's way of life as a result of a complete change of thought and attitude with regard to sin and righteousness. The Gospel Coalition stated uh, on their website that true Christian repentance involves a heartfelt conviction of sin, a contrition over the offense of God, a turning away from the sinful way of life, and turning towards a God-honoring way of life. In summarizing his ministry, Paul declared, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. In short, turning from sin, turning to God, which results in a change of mind, which results in a change of heart, which changes our actions. It's important that not only do we think differently, that we feel differently, and that we act differently. We must do all. It is a full package. When, when people talk about being saved or coming to Christ, many times they don't leave room for our actions. Christianity is an action. It's, it's following Christ and doing what Christ asks us to do. And, and we'll get deeper into that in a little bit, but don't get me wrong, works does not save us, but works shows that we are saved. So, why is repentance important, and why do we talk about repentance? Uh, well, Jesus told us to. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to be in verse 46. And I purposely didn't mark my Bible so I wouldn't get ahead of myself. So, Luke 24... Verse 46, it's at the, almost at the very end of the book of Luke. I still hear pages turning. All right, everybody good? Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witness of these things. But even with the clear command from Jesus, it seems that many leave repentance out today. We hear a lot about asking for forgiveness. We hear a lot about if he would just be in church. We hear a lot about grace. We hear a lot about grace. And thank God we have grace. Because without grace, none of us would make it into heaven. Jesus was born of a virgin, walked this earth for 33 and a half years. He spent the last three and a half years preaching and teaching. He was rejected, beaten, tortured, nailed to a cross where he died for us. Three days later, he rose from the dead and was seen by over 500 people over a 40-day period. Then he ascended to heaven where he sits at the right hand of his Father, where he is interceding for all who believe. And that should be all of us. Because of what Jesus did, 
Those that repent and believe receive grace. So grace is a very, very big deal. But we have to get to grace. And we've all been told that we can do nothing to save ourselves, that only Jesus saves us. And that's true. We cannot work our way into heaven. We cannot be good enough to get into heaven without Jesus. But we must believe. And belief is an action. We must believe that Jesus is God, believe that he was born of a virgin, believe he did indeed die, paying the price for all the sins that none of us here could pay, and believe that he was resurrected on the third day, conquering death so that we may live eternally with him and our Heavenly Father. But there is one more action that is required. We must repent. We must turn from our stinking thinking, as Pastor Woody likes to say, and turn to God and live as Jesus has called us to live. Many times we hear about repenting or repentance, but a lot of times it's watered down. It's, it's thought of as, well, if I'll stop my sin and then I'll go over here and I'll ask for forgiveness and repent and then I can go right back to my sin. And that's not how it works. Now, we are forgiven as we go if we ask for forgiveness, but we can't just continue to be the exact same people we were when we come to Jesus and ask him for forgiveness. Let's all turn over to Acts 2. We're going to be flipping a lot today. I felt Woody tell me that we needed a lot of verses today, so I wanted to make sure that y'all didn't get, get slowed down because he wasn't here. So we're going to be at Acts 2. We're going to be in verse 37. Now, repentance, ugh, repentance is not simply something we do. It is the start of a complete change of our heart. It's not a, a one and done type thing. It's not behavior modification. It's not something that we can change, which many people are able to make themselves look that way. But if you're with somebody long enough, you will realize who they really are. So it's not a, a, a behavioral thing, it is a heart thing. But we must, repentance and, and asking forgiveness is allowing the power of Jesus to work within us to remove the sins that are in our body and in our, in our, in our flesh. Um, it's the key to our salvation. So Acts 2, verse 37. After Peter preached what was probably the second greatest sermon ever, after the Sermon on the Mount, he was asked what the people should do to be saved. And his answer was, uh, let's see. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter, Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the, rem for the remission of sins. And you shall receive you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Go ahead and flip over to uh, Acts 17 also. Um, because the two words, and I, I don't remember what the number was, but there was an abundance of people who was brought to the Lord after this message that Peter had given. And the only two things that he said we needed to do was repent and be baptized. And Paul give us um, the importance of repentance. He stood in, immense, in the midst of, all right, I mean, I've been working on this, Arepagus, Arepagus in Athens. Uh, it's where a lot of people gathered and uh, they all worshiped their gods. Well, there was a unknown god, an idol to an unknown god, and as Paul was, he never lacked for a moment to talk about Jesus. So in verses 30, so we're in Acts 17, verse 30.
truly, these times of ignorance of God, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And of course, he's talking about Jesus. So we must repent. We must turn from our evil ways because the day of judgment has been appointed. Everybody will stand before God. A lot of people think that only the sinners or the unredeemed, because we're all sinners, will stand before God, but we all will. The unredeemed will stand before him and be judged and cast into the eternal lake of fire. The redeemed will stand before him in determination of what they did with what they had. Because we all get into heaven if we are redeemed and Jesus is our Lord and Savior. But what did we do during that time, during the time here on earth? Um, in Matthew 3, uh, you don't have to go there, but it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's, in, that's uh, Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2. In Matthew 4, Jesus himself repeated old John and said, For that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's Matthew 4, verse 17. And we'll get one more from Peter. The Lord is not slack, uh, the Lord is not slacking concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long su suffering but towards, uh, towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Jesus has not returned yet because he's still waiting on people to repent. We all, and, and, and I'm as guilty as anybody, come Jesus, come. But that's a selfish thing for all of us because since our job is to go out into the world and to talk to people about Jesus, then us leaving is a selfish thing because we are part of having these people repent. We don't get them to do it, but we give them the message and they um, are touched. Not touched, maybe not, but well, I guess it is kind of touched. Um, Jesus touches them. Because without Jesus, we can't. There is no repentance. There is no forgiveness. There is no grace. We must know Jesus. And he will return when God finally decides that enough people have repented. And uh, as much as I'd like to see us all leave this evil worth and go join him in heaven, it makes me sad the people who won't. So as long as he wants to take for us to continue to talk to these people, then we're all for it. It's like Paul said that, you know, he, he, he wished he could have been in heaven, but if he was remaining here on earth, then it was so he could talk to more people and introduce more people to Jesus. So repent, repent, repent. It's all throughout the Bible. We must turn from our sinful lives and turn to Jesus. We should realize that the Bible does speak of different levels of sin. But a sin is a sin. No matter how small or how large we categorize it, God hates sin. A book I've been reading recently by uh, author Jeff Bridges, uh, he said, I'm not suggesting all sin offends God equally, but I am saying that all sin offends God. For whoever shall keep the whole law and, and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. That's Second James chapter 2, verse 10. And a lot of people say that we're not under the law. And we're not under the law. And thank the Lord we're not under the law because nobody can keep it. But the law is still there. It remains there to make us aware of our sin. If we didn't have the law, we wouldn't be aware of what sin is. 
Let's turn over to Romans chapter 7. Paul talks about this. Romans chapter 7, we're going to be in verse 7. Paul, being a Jew, probably covers this as well as anybody because he understood what it meant to be under the law and the grace that were shown not being under the law. So Romans chapter 12, I mean chapter 7, sorry, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetous unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore, therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. The law shows us our sin. And it shows us our sin, so we will repent. Our, the whole reason for the law is to show us that we need a Savior. It was preparing the way for Christ. And we all know, who, who have studied through the Bible, that the Old Testament talks about Jesus throughout it. And it talks about our need for a Savior. And it showed through all the sacrifice and through all of the things that was required to do in the Old Testament covenant that it's impossible. It, it can't be done. Only one person has ever walked this earth sin-free, sinless, and that's Jesus. Nobody else has. There's been a lot of great men, but only Jesus was able to do it. And true repentance is the key to forgiveness, which is the key to God's grace. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus twice said, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He said it in verses 3 and verses 5. So he was pretty serious about it. When we think of God's saving grace, we must think of forgiveness. God forgives us of our sin, and that forgiveness is our salvation. We can't get to heaven without it. The author of Hebrews said in verse 26 of chapter 10, For if we sin willing, willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. If we continue to live in sin, knowing it, actively engaging in it, and purposely sinning against God, will he not continue to forgive us? I think the more appropriate question is, if we continue to live in sin, did we truly repent? When we come to Jesus, we ask for forgiveness, and we must repent of all our sins. And Jesus will meet us there. As long as we come humbly and with an honest heart, we ask to be forgiving for the sin of the past, and we repent. We turn away from it. We move away from those sins. We lay those sins at Jesus' feet, not to pick them up again. We don't want to go back to them. Because if we do, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11 says, As a dog returns to its own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. And that's not a pleasant thought. But sin's not a pleasant thing. Sin is dirty. It's nasty. God hates sin. He will not be in the presence of sin. He doesn't take sin lightly, and neither should we. 
we should hate sin as much as he does. Because the only way we can understand how bad it is is to understand how much he truly hates it. And, and through this, I've seen a debate about God can't be in the presence of sin. And that's not true. God is more powerful than anything. But he hates it so much he doesn't want to be in the presence of it. So, knowing that when we come to Jesus, we repent of our previous sins, and we ask for forgiveness, does that mean that Jesus' sacrifice only covers those sins of the past? No, as followers of Jesus, all our sins are covered, past, past presence, and future. But that does not mean that we're free to continue sinning as the people we were before we came to Jesus. That's why we need Jesus. We can't stop sinning on our own. We do not have the power. We can modify our behavior and we can change our habits, but the sin is still there. And the sin will continually be there. It's like, oops, sorry, for those who have smoked, that was one of the hardest things I had to quit doing. Oops, sorry. And as long as the cigarettes were there, I couldn't stop. I had to remove them. Well, we, with our sin nature in our body, cannot remove those sins. Only Jesus can remove those sins. Please turn over to Proverbs. We're going to be in chapter 6. As we look out into the world, watch TV, go to the store, we see that the seriousness that people look at sin has gone. We are living in Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 36, I think it is. God has started turning many, many over to their sin. He is allowing them to get all they want and see the destruction that comes with it. God hates sin so much, he is, he is willing to let us have it so we ourselves can see. It's, it's like, and I see it, and, and I think that's why I was given my grandson before uh, I become an associate pastor. Because if you don't have children, you don't understand, and we don't understand everything that God thinks, but if you don't have children of your own, you don't understand how frustrating God can get with us because we act just like him. I'll tell Bobby, don't do this because if you do, your Nini's going to get angry. So what does he do? He does that, and Nini gets angry. Don't do that or you're going to hurt yourself. So what does he do? He does that, and he hurts himself. And we do that every day with God. So if you have children, you at least understand how frustrating it can be to tell something, something little human who's hard-headed. He's just like me in that part. Boy, he don't listen. Um, and, and I do the same thing. I mean, I hear in my, soul, in my spirit, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. So what I do, I do that. And then whenever it happens, whatever the results are, I can't blame anybody but myself because I've stepped into it myself. But he, God is on record for hate and sin. He was so done with man's sin, he destroyed the earth. Only eight people survived the floods. And if Noah hadn't been such a righteous man, we may not be here now. So we have to thank Noah for that. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah totally, completely to where it can't be found because of sin. God does not take sin lightly. And neither can we. And I'm not talking about how bad we are. We all know how bad we are. But we must make sure we know what God's word says. Sin has been diluted. And in a lot of places, a lot of churches, people think God's okay with it. Well, that's just how I am. That's how he created me. So it's okay if I do this or I do that. And he doesn't. He's just very, very gracious and long-suffering and wants us all 
to come to his son. As we look around the world, it's easy to see that many of us do not know what the actual Bible says. Few take sin seriously, and I'm not talking about the lost, the people who don't know Christ, because they're going to do what they're going to do. It's not our job to tell them what to do. It's our job to tell them about Jesus, but we're not in the business of telling the lost how to live. Now, we are to correct our fellow Christians when they are wrong, but we do it lovingly and we do it caringly because the world's view of love is allowing people to do what they want to do and helping them along so they're happy. God's view is telling them the truth, and the truth is painful, but we must do it if we truly love the people. And I understand that, that we can't judge people's hearts. We don't know where they stand when it comes to God, but we can see their fruits. We can see their actions. And as in the men's discipleship group we do here on Monday, uh, the gentleman who does our videos, uh, Rick Burgess, says, you can say anything you want to say, but when you spend time with somebody, you're going to find out who they really are. Because there's a lot of people out there who say who they are but they're really not that. And that's important for us as Christians when we profess to follow in Jesus, and we need to look like we follow Jesus. Because if we don't, then people get a mixed message. And that's why when you hear reports of as many Christians as non-Christians uh, get divorced and they feel the same way on this, that, and the other, that's not because the Christians have changed. That's because people who don't know what it means to be a Christian claim to be Christians. Proverbs 6, verse 16. Uh, if I could get in the right chapter. 16. These six things the Lord hates, and seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among, discord among the brethren. A proud look, a lying tongue. I think we all expect to see hands that shed innocent blood, but a look and a lie. God takes all sin seriously. Wicked plans and running to evil are logical, but we must remember that anything that is not from God, that is not of God, that does not glorify God, is considered evil. Things that many think are harmless, things like your horoscope, going to a psychic to get your daily advice, either for fun, is evil. It's witchcraft. It is of Satan and not of God. Choosing to binge on the latest shoot 'em up series or that show that you would never let the kids watch instead of serving your brothers and sisters in the community or studying your Bible can be sin. I'm not saying that we can't watch TV, that we can't have downtime, that we can't relax, but we must be conscious of what we watch. Garbage in, garbage out. Anybody who's ever dealt with computer programmers, that's how they talk. Um, and we must be conscious of what we do and how we use our time. Well, God's time. We're all here because we have a purpose. When we achieve our purpose, we're no longer here. Our sister-in-law just passed away this week. She had survived a heart transplant. And she was 32, correct? Well, she was a devout Christian. And we know that she completed whatever task God had put her here. Because when she received her heart, she was within days of passing away. So she wasn't done then. But she's done now. And now she is healed. She is walking with Jesus. And she's happy. And I just can't wait till I get there. To spend time with her and my other family members. Um... So the time we have, we have been given by God. So we should use that time wisely. And most of us has read Paul's list of those things, of those who will not inherit 
uh, the kingdom of God. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Let's turn over to Galatians 5. So all of those, I can see that. Because we start allowing the world's thinking to get into our head. So when we read the Bible and we see what the Bible says, many times it's easy for us to go, well, that's unreasonable. But we're thinking with human mind. We're not thinking with God's mind. So we're going to be in verse 19 of Galatians chapter 5. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcerer, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outburst of wrath, self-ambitions, dissension, heresy, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelers, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in past times, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if you continue on that, it talks about the fruits of the spirits, which is the opposite. And these are who we should be. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, it takes time to get all these things, but our goal should always be to be like Jesus. Many times we talk about how great Peter was, and Peter was great after the Holy Spirit. And we talk about David, and David was great when he had the Spirit. But the only person to walk this earth who was always great and never failed was Jesus Christ. And that's who we, men and women both, should look to be just like him. Jesus said in Mark 7, For within, for from within, for from within, out of the hearts of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thieves, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these things come from within a defiled man. And again, we expect murder. We expect evil eye, wickedness. But foolishness? The Bible says that God will use the foolish. And I'm proof of that. And I am thankful for that. But when we do foolish things... I'm trying to think of the way to, to put this. When we do foolish things, we don't follow his word. I guess is the easiest way to say it. There's probably a more eloquent way to put it, but that's, that's it. Because, I mean, in this day and time of all those things that I read, many consider those to be normal day-to-day -day things. I mean, we would think nobody would consider murder to be a normal, normal thing, but look how many people think abortion is the way to go. Birth control, population control, that's murder. There's people who think thieves is okay because, because they're in need. And I understand people are in need, but stealing is not the way that you handle that. There, there's cities in this country now who you can't walk into and buy something without somebody with a key because when we walk into our grocery stores, you have these big shelves. You reach up, you grab it, and you go. Well, there's stores in the defund the police department areas they have glass and you have to get somebody to walk with you to unlock it because there's places in this country that if you steal less than a thousand dollars worth they don't even charge you because these people are in need now i agree there probably should be more and better outreach but thieves 
and like that is it, it, it's unacceptable no matter where you're at but we have turned this world into accepting what is evil and it says in the bible that that good will be uh evil and evil will be good and that's where we're at there is no doubt about that um I, Lori and I had a DVR for so long I hadn't watched commercials in years and, and most of these new streaming channels you have to watch the commercials and I am just floored at what they're putting in commercials it, it's, it's unbelievable because not only is a lot of it sin in the way we look at the world but some of it's just plain raunchy uh, even by what, what used to be, when I was a kid, civilized people's views. Now there is no civilized peoples. Civilized peoples, is that what I said? I just make them up as I go along. You know what, just, just go with me. Just go with me. English was not my strong language. I've been trying to learn Spanish. I can't even speak English, so Spanish has really been difficult. Um... And, and believe me, I'm fully aware that every message that God gives me to give to y'all is directed at me first and foremost. Um, even Paul said it, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. That's Romans chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. But he does that for all of us. When we're in a place doing things we shouldn't be doing, God's going to tell you. Now, it won't be an audible voice going, Chris, stop what you're doing. It'll be that, that, that conscience we feel. And, and when we receive these things, it's designed so we will stop and examine ourselves. Examine, examine where we're at. And, and it may not be that minute, but, but what are we doing with our life? But we don't want to be that person that receives it and then goes, oh, well, that's what he does. We don't want to be the person who projects our sins at other people because, well, obviously, we're perfect. God is so lucky to have me. Well, there's a lot of people that think that, and, 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 it's, and it's sad because it comes back to that retrobate mind, retrobate mind. But we want to make sure when God gives us this that we don't ignore the opportunity to correct something in our life that is hindering our walk with Christ. Because the people who will project, they are those people who, they will quickly condemn those who have same-sex attraction. But they will never say anything about a man looking lustfully upon a woman, treating her as an object. We are happy, I mean, they are happy to call drunkenness a sin, but they won't address their own gluttonous, their, their addictions that they may have. No one's sin is more vile than our own personal sins. And that's exactly how we should look at it. All sin is bad, but if it's within us, we should really, really focus on that. Because Pastor Woody says it, if we would take the time to work on our own, we wouldn't have time to worry about anybody else. And we're never going to be perfect, and, and we should not not help others. If we see a brother or sister in Christ who is doing something that the Bible clearly says is a sin we should talk to them about it. We shouldn't point fingers. We shouldn't condemn them, but we should talk to them because my personal belief is we live in a time to where people think they know what's in this book, but they have no clue because they have been given twisted messages. They have been given simple little verses that have been expanded on to mean what it doesn't mean. I was talking to a, a, a guy I'm in, a, I do a, we do the men's discipleship class here on Fridays, I mean Monday nights, it's 7, 6.30. I got so much going on, I can't remember. It's from 6.30 to 7.30. We'd love to have you men out here come check us out one time. Everybody who does it loves it. But I do it, the same class in, a, in a, the fourth year curriculum. We're in the first year here. 
uh, with some gentlemen on Zoom out of Alabama. And actually one of them was in Israel when the war started. They spent two days getting from Jerusalem to Jordan to get on a plane to get back here. It was quite a story. But he had made the comment that they had went, that group had went over there specifically to evangelize, to share the gospel. And so when he was asking these Jews about Isaiah and these other verses in the Bible that talk about Jesus, he said they would say, never heard that one. So, so not only are the Jewish priests leaving out a whole side of the Bible, they're pulling verses out so people don't know about Jesus. That's wrong. And that's why if we talk to somebody and they're clearly wrong, then again, we don't, we don't condemn them, but we do need to let them know that they're wrong. But we also need to be able to back it up with the Bible to make sure we're not wrong. Because I've told many guys, one in particular, that if I ever say anything from this pulpit or anywhere that's not true to the Bible to let me know. Because I'm human. And I can be just as wrong as anybody else. So it's important that we lean on each other. Because if we truly love each other, then we want to make sure that we're all going to the same place. We, we don't lift people up in sin. We don't encourage that sin. We don't go, hurrah, you're different, and we're just proud of you for being you. No, we love our relatives. We love our kids. We love these people. But we need to love them enough to be honest with them. Because if we ignore these things and we make excuses for these things, then we're not doing what God had called us to do. And we shouldn't ignore them within ourselves because we are here to set an example. We are here to talk about Jesus. We are here to be his hands and feet. Repentance is not a one and done thing. As we sin, as sin is brought to our attention, and, and God does that as we go along, you'll have something that happened 30 years ago that'll pop into your head. That's God bringing it to your attention so you can repent of it. And we will do that throughout our lives. It's an ongoing part of our Christian life. But the first time is the most important time. That's when we go to God and give him the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, we give him the bad and ugly because there is no good except for God. After we give our lives to Jesus, we must continue to repent. As the Lord brings us past sins, we repent from them. We will continue to do this throughout our lives. But if you have never repented, if you have yet to turn to God, or you thought you turned to God, but then realize that you didn't, or you have um, drifted away, and you have those things that you still want to repent about, because remember, tomorrow is not guaranteed. We like to put things off. Many people like to put things off. But what we may be planning to do tomorrow may not happen. So now is the time. There are people all over the world who think they have time. There's, there, there was people at a music festival a few weeks back who thought they had however long they had. And they did because they were killed. It was their time. So we all need to remember that we may not have that last opportunity. Because there is a lot of people thank the Lord that on their deathbed they will confess Jesus and come to him. But not everybody gets that opportunity. If you want... If you thought you had Jesus but realized you didn't, then we need to repent. You need to come to the Lord. We are giving opportunity after opportunity before, during, and after to get right with the Lord. And a lot of people don't because they think they've got wonderful things that they do and God will ruin it. Well, I can tell you, I run with a lot of people, rode motor motorcycles. I did many things before I come to God, and, and my life is better now than it's ever been. 
I know anybody who has uh, had a drinking problem, I don't know how you can wake up on Saturday morning and think, wow, what a good life I got as you're hugging the toilet and thanking the Lord that you didn't go to jail the night before. But that's what we tend to do. Um, I will, I'm going to speak more on, on repentance next week. Um, but as I talk to people and as I look around the world, as I engage with, and not locally, but, but I'm on a Facebook page that's called Pastor to Pastor. And, and as I engage with pastors and I see some of the thoughts and some of the, the teachings and I see how they look at, at, at the world, I wonder if they ever really read the book. Because I think looking at religion as it is in the Western countries, the United States and other Western countries, we don't worry about what God thinks. We worry about what Ted thinks. We worry about what Michael thinks. And we worry about the people of the world. And, and we want to have friends and we want to be part of something. Um, you know, and I forget how we are until I see how my grandson is and well nobody will play with me well sometimes you just got to go it on your own buddy and sometimes we have to do that we're fortunate to have this community we're fortunate to have the other churches in this area and, and I pray that as a community that these churches will start getting more involved with each other because part of the thing Satan has successfully done is separated the churches. We are all part of the body of Christ. We are all a church. But we certainly like to think that what we're doing is better than what anybody else is doing. And that's not true. What God's doing is better than what anybody else is doing. So if any of you are in need of God, if any of you uh, need prayer, uh, we'll be down here in a minute, and we encourage everybody to come out for prayer. As one of our members used to say, we need the prayer. Y'all need to practice. But everybody needs prayer. You need prayer in the bad times. You need prayer in the good times. So, if I men, if you'll remove your hats, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this time. <coughs> we thank you for allowing us to gather like this. We thank you for all these people. We thank you for the people who are watching. We ask that you will lay it on our hearts and lay it on our minds to talk to somebody today. To just reach out to somebody who is there that we know, we can see, is in need of you. It may be a fellow Christian. And they may know you, but they may be struggling with something. And we just want to be the light, Lord. We live in a world that is falling apart. And we, we know that this is part of your plan, but that doesn't always make it easier for us. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to serve you in all the ways you've called us to serve you. And we ask, we ask that you'll just continue to allow us to do that. And for anybody who, who doesn't know God, we just ask that you uh, focus on him and repeat after me. Dear Lord, I am a sinner and I have come to realize that, that I need you, that you are the only way. I ask that you will take my hand and lead me through this process. I repent of all the things I have done, Lord. I turn to you and I give my life to you. I ask that you will allow me to be a part of your kingdom and I am just so thankful for what you did on that cross at Calvary and rising again on the third day that frees me and allows me to ask for forgiveness to be a part of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. And again, if anybody needs prayer, we ask that you come down here and we will pray with you. We will pray for you. Uh, if you know somebody that needs prayer and they're not here, you can stand in for them. I'm okay. so weary, but I must go. Boy, everybody's blessed today. Oh, here he goes.
I know you need prayer, brother. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Ruth and Grady. Both are she. She's. But I'm gonna anoint you, dear Lord. I just ask that you will lay your hands upon Ruth, that you will remove this cancer from her body. Or we know that it's a horrible, horrible thing, and that it is running rampant in our world right now. And we know that you are the great healer, and that you can do it. We ask that you will comfort her, that you will be with her, Lord, that you will be with Grady and you will comfort him. We know that it's a bad situation, but we pray that you will lay your hands upon him, lift him up, and let them know that you are there with them. And no matter what happens, you are going to be there with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord, we just ask that you'll continue to lift Crystal up, that you will remove this sickness from her body. We ask that you will give her comfort through this, knowing that you are there with her. Or we ask that you'll bless the doctors and the nurses and whoever else is on the team that is assisting her, that you allow them to lean on your knowledge, not theirs, that you will allow them to use your experience and not theirs, Lord. We know that you are the great healer and that all things are possible for you, through you, Lord, and we just thank you. Thank you for allowing us to stand here and come before you and um, just just honor you Lord. in Jesus name we ask this amen, amen. anybody else let's go Ted Ted Beverly. let's go y'all pray for everybody else I want to come pray for y'all I want to anoint both of you Lord, we just ask that you'll continue being with Ted and Beverly. We ask that you'll clear his lungs, that you'll strengthen her heart, that you will allow them to continue to be the great prayer warriors that they have been throughout their lives. Lord, we thank you for blessing us with them at our church, and we just, oh, we're just so, so thankful, Lord. You have blessed us, you have blessed them, and you are a complete blessing to everybody. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, anybody else? Nobody has a prayer for it. Come on, Wave. Come on, brother. Anoint you, brother. Right there. I'll do it very lightly. Oh, up here. Well, you mean stomp on your toe? It might help you feel better. <laughs> Lord, we just ask that you'll lay your hands upon William. Touch him from head to toe. Heal all the injuries that he has. Heal all the injuries that he's had, Lord. We ask that you will clear his mind, clear his body of all these issues, that you will strengthen him and allow him to continue serving you in the way he has always served you. Lord, we're just thankful that he's here with us. We're thankful that you have once again delivered him from uh, the evil that was trying to get him. We ask that you'll be with his mother. Just lift her up and allow her to continue to, to help him and to serve you in the way that you've called her to. Lord, we are just so, so thankful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Love you, brother. Don't squeeze too hard. <laughs> ah.